Dread it. Run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. Thanos got that thing right. He got that right. Here we are again. It's Leafs. It's Bruins. It's round one. God forbid we meet in a different round. Low quality fans of a high quality Bruins team, welcome back. We're going to talk about this series. And I actually want to start with something that is Steve Dangle related. Because I watched his preview right before I jumped on here. Uh, and <laughs> he said out loud, with the boldness and vigor of a much younger, much, much more sheltered hockey fan, that there's no reason the Leafs should lose this series on paper. And you know what? Kudos to him, because that had to be hard to say, given their history. It had to be hard to say. And I agree. I totally agree. On paper, eh, this is a little lopsided in most areas, not all of them. But when it comes down to it, the star power that the Leafs can roll out and the way they can control the puck against our best lines will be the largest advantage they have. There's no reason the Leafs should lose this series on paper. You gotta say on paper. First of all, because it's hockey. And who actually knows, right? Who knows? Second of all, because it's the Leafs. So who actually knows? Who knows? I thought, it was a, I thought it was a bold thing to say. I have a hard time saying that kind of stuff about the Bruins in general. Uh, game 5, I was, or right before Game 5, I was real confident last year because it looked like the Panthers had all but stopped playing hockey. And we were getting healthier by the game. This team wasn't even at its best. And then, of course, that health wasn't what we thought it was. They get a gift in overtime and everything collapses. The Bruins should have, since 2019 at least, a pretty similar feeling than Leafs fans have. Because it's really difficult for us to make a real run. We have continuously shown up in the playoffs the past few years and haven't been able to go deep. Now there's all sort of asterisks and extenuating circumstances for that, but that's also hockey. I'm not going to sit here and, and go boo-hoo Bruins and act like we're the Buffalo Sabres, right? We get playoff hockey every year, and yeah, the team hasn't been able to make a run in a while, and 2019 was awesome. Obviously, it didn't end the way you wanted it to, but how much fun was that until it wasn't? The Leafs should win this series, and we're going to talk about it. Do I believe the Leafs will win this series? Who knows? I think it's going to be a good series. God, I hope it's a good series. I really do. Before we get too deep into this, the bracket challenge, link below. Join it. Join it. It's free. There's a password to enter, but it's free. You could win a free jersey. Winner gets a free jersey. I'm going to buy you one. If it's me who wins, I buy myself a jersey. Last year, a Habs fan won. Don't let that happen. I'm still mad at you guys about it. Yeah, sure, I had a bracket in there too, but I get to choose who to be mad at. I'm not going to be mad at myself. That's ridiculous. Join it. It'll be fun. But let's talk about the series a little bit. Like, I'm a subscribe. Nailed it. We're going to go through a couple stats here that encapsulate the full 82 games and where we compare. And we'll start with goals 4 per 60. The Bruins 14th. Toronto's 4th. All right. Advantage Toronto. Goals allowed per 60. Bruins are 5th. Toronto's 18th. Advantage Bruins. Power play percentage. 13th for the Bruins. 7th for Toronto. That can be kind of expected. Penalty kill percentage, 7th for the Bruins, 22nd for Toronto. 5v5 save percentage, a big one, 3rd for the Bruins, 21st for Toronto. 5v5 expected goals for percentage. So this takes into account the dangerous chances that you are creating versus the dangerous chances you're allowing. And it basically tells you, hey, this is how often you should be scoring uh, this is how many more goals you should be scoring than the other team. But we ranked 18th in that. They ranked 11th. 5v5 shot percentage. We ranked 4th. They ranked 3rd. And then face-off percentage. We ranked 18th. They ranked 4th. One of the bigger subplots of this is how much of an advantage that's going to be for Toronto. It's a nice little snapshot of 
how the season went. But let's be honest, if you're using that to judge how a team's going to look in the playoffs, you're missing some key variables. Teams change, they grow, trade deadlines, new acquisitions from the offseason that took time to actually adjust and be more part of the team and their systems. Let's look at a couple stats from the last two months that I think better represent who these teams are. And we're going to start with one that's really concerning from the Bruins end. Boston ranks 25th in offense at all strengths, right? Including power play and 5-on-5, 4v4, all of them. 2.74 goals per game, which is even lower than our goals allowed per game during that stretch, which is, you know, concerning. It ranks top 10. The goals allowed per game is 2.79, but you obviously don't want one number to be bigger than the other in that one. You want it the other way. Offense. Either way, some of this has to do with the putrid power play, which is scoring just 16% of the time whew, through the last couple of months, ranking 28th in the league through that stretch. But at 5v5, the only other playoff team that scores less than we do is the Capitals. The one, you know, the team that everyone's like, that team sucks. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. Meanwhile, Toronto has been the best five-on-five -five offense in the league over that stretch by a mile. It's not even close. They're scoring almost 3.5 goals per game at five-on-five. -five. That doesn't even take into account their power play. Offense is Toronto's domain. They control the puck. They'll move the puck well. They'll bring the puck up ice. Transition is intense with them. Like those are goal scoring opportunities for their for them. But they can also set up in our zone and whittle us down and hope for that Ben Ben break kind of shift. It's concerning, obviously, when it's that lopsided. People like to talk about the Leafs' depth, which I think they have a little bit of, but not a lot. And the home ice advantage is actually going to make a little bit of a difference in this series, I think. Because the Zaka line is going to be desperate to get away from the top six of the Leafs. It's going to matter. And desperate might not be the best word that you want to hear, but you need to have a line that's freed up to play against lesser competition. And if you have second change, like you do for multiple periods on home games, that matters. Because the top six of the Leafs will out-control us. That's going to be a theme through every series that we play. The, it's been a theme through the entire season. The Bruins do not control play as well as other playoff teams. They just don't. They rely on their superstar talent to score in transition with the occasional special teams goal or the occasional set up, blast it from the point, get the rebound, and throw it in. But they focus on quick attacks. And defensively, they're more about shot suppression for high danger chances more than rip the puck away and get going, right? They're looking for the other team to make that mistake of, all right, they shot at a weird angle and we get to spring a transition because it wrapped around the boards at the right spot. Off we go. Or block a shot, get the puck moving. We suppress high danger areas. We allow them to buzz around the edges. Unfortunately, that's one of Toronto's specialties is getting in those areas, getting set up, and then peppering the net. Concerns, because we need to have our top six freed up from their top six. Because the God honest truth is their top six has more talent they can roll out. I mean, no offense to your your DeBrus, Geeky, Heinens. Uh, I mean, even Zaka falls in this category. Coyle falls in this category. They've been really good, right? But when you talk about true top six high-end talent, you got Marchand. Which, I mean, there's, his play right now isn't at its best, and you have Pasternak. And then other than that, you have guys who are playing in roles that are a little above their heads, but they're playing solid hockey. I'm less worried about Coyle and Zaka, more worried about DeBrusque, who again, I like, but he has to be on one of his hot streaks. And of course, Heinen, who I like, but you'd hardly consider him a true top six talent. On the other end, you've got Marner and Matthews and Bertuzzi and Nylander and Tavares and I mean, Nyes has looked really good, and Domi's actually come alive for them. Bertuzzi, I mentioned, and a lot of us laugh, but he's been really good the last month and a half of the season. So I'm spending too much time on this one point, but the top six is lopsided. Advantage Toronto. But let's pick on the Leafs a little bit. This shouldn't be all negative. 
Toronto is below average in goals allowed per game. 3.23 goals allowed per game. Only the Lightning and the Knights rank below them, as far as playoff teams go, in all strengths goal suppression, meaning we're including their penalty kill. The Bruins, ranking 10th, allowing 2.91 goals a game, obviously aided by stellar goaltending play, is really what's giving the black and gold their biggest boot vote of confidence, in that, for skaters at least. Slow the Leafs' top six to a crawl, bog them down, and win it in the trenches. That's basically what the Bruins are looking at. Usually the trenches line isn't one you say about a team you're genuinely confident in, but they do say defense wins championships. In that regard, the Bruins certainly look stronger. And if we dig a little deeper through that, Bruins fans want to talk about how weak Toronto's blue line is. I've, I've been seeing it everywhere. And at first glance, I hardly disagree. To a point. Riley is a puck-moving, minute-eating, top-pairing defenseman. He needs a steady D partner to work with, though, because... Defensively, he's just not very good. And TJ Brody, who he's been spending most of his time with this season, just hasn't been consistent. He certainly hasn't held up his side of the bargain of like, you shut down the top guy on the other line, allow Riley to do the puck moving thing. And then you dig a little deeper into their defensive core, and you've got McCabe and Lilligren and Timmins and Giordano and Benoit, Edmondson, Lebushkin. They They have all these options and each of these players have had highs and lows through the season but the constant trend is they aren't exiting the zone cleanly they don't handle four checks super well regardless of the pairing that they're throwing out there for the most part there's a lot of difficulty with the back end who are some are puck moving defensemen some are big bodies but nobody nobody really has that I am a shutdown dude who's having a good season in that area. They really aren't. This is why transition attack is going to be so important. The Bruins like their back end. They like who they have. And while we will likely have a pair that we're a little nervous about, whether that be a Grizz Carlo pair where we haven't seen great numbers from them yet because Linto and McAvoy are likely working together, uh, or it's the third pair of Peak and someone, it's looking like Shattenkirk right now because we're trying to wake up our power play and we're willing to say goodbye to some of the defense that Watherspoon brings. But the Bruins do like their back end. And they have a solid mix of puck-moving defensemen and shutdown guys. Whereas the Leafs look to have a few puck-moving defensemen and guys who should be shutting down bigger players. But there's space available. And that's been a consistent problem with the Leafs all year is four check gets in, it disturbs them, and then space is created, and they struggle to break out from their zone after that. The Bruins like the flexibility that they have. They have a 7th and 8th D that they can move in and be mostly comfortable with because of what they're bringing and what they're seeing in the series means they need that thing, right? Otherwise, of course, it could be injuries that just pull a guy in. But it feel like the Leafs have to play a certain way on their back end, and there is an advantage there. The only issue is the Leafs are so good at counterattacking that if they do break that puck out and you really went in on the forecheck, you are giving up space the other way. There's going to be a very delicate balance with that. And line changes, something the Bruins have been weak at all year, are going to become very, very important in this series. Clean ones, I mean. We covered offense. We covered defense. Let's talk about the special teams. And they're reversed of each other. I don't think either team holds a distinct advantage here. The power play, we discussed it above, uh, looks fucking horrendous for the Bruins. It's awful. It's terrible. 16% through the last two and a half months. That's not going to win shit, right? And you're hoping that a Shattenkirk on the top power play unit helps with that. But Toronto's penalty kill unit has allowed a goal on almost one-fourth of their penalties so far over the last two months. 25th in the league. That's bad. Neither team holds a big advantage here because they're just polar opposites. I Toronto's power play excellent. Bruins penalty kill, really strong. So you're just putting strength against strength and weakness against weakness. It's really weird. Here's the thing. I probably tilt the bar a little bit to Toronto because our power play is so inept that it's really hard to see even a bad penalty kill unit, unit struggling with them. I think the high-powered Power play of the Toronto Maple Leafs probably has a better chance to make an impact in this series. That being said, 
This one's real close to call, so we can call that a wash if you really want to. The biggest advantage, though, by far for the Bruins, is the goaltending. It's a no contest. The last two months have seen Samsonov grab the Toronto net for the most part because he keeps winning. But the problem is he's got a below average save percentage through all those wins, an 899. He's winning games, but he's playing below average. He's a huge X factor in this series. If he gets hot, the Bruins don't have a chance. If he continues to struggle, the Leafs might not have a chance. <laughs> it's that bad. Like, it's really, he's one or the other. On the other end, you would think the Bruins are very confident. I think Olmark should get the game one start. He's just been the better goalie over the last two months. Swayman's history against the Leafs, though, this season, a 966, a 970, and a 943 save percentage. Three different games, three different wins, absolute domination. If you're sitting there, if Monty goes, no, I want to play the guy who likes playing this team, great. Swayman's also had a 903 save percentage over the past two and a half months, while Olmark's 917 looks quite a bit sparklier. It's a tough call. I think Olmark gets game one, but it won't. Both goalies will see time. And if one's struggling, the other one's going to play. The Bruins should be confident that one of their goalies is going to have a strong series. This is where their biggest advantage lies. Because if they can use that to even out the offensive woes, so the Bruins might struggle to score, but if the Leafs can't get anything going either, it's a dogfight. You drag them into the trenches, and you win it there. Is that enough to make me think that the Bruins should win the series? Again, not really. Because at the end of the day, with the special teams feeling like a wash, our top six going to be outperformed by their top six, at least as far as puck possession and control of minutes go. The defense being Boston's advantage to a degree, but really they're going to have to play a bend, 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 don't break to allow Pasternak to counterattack, especially on nights where he's getting matched up with other with the least top lines and unable to escape them. The series is just two fundamentally different teams built on different foundations trying to prove that their way is the way to go. It feels like a seven-game series, right? It must be. It's Boston-Toronto. It's got to be. But for those of you who really like the advanced analytics, the gosh darn truth is the Leafs should win this series. They should. They have too much star power and too much scoring power. And while their back end and goaltending are a little suspect at times, we keep going back through the history of the league and finding that although depth matters to a degree, oftentimes there are two things that win a playoff series. And that's star power, and that's goaltending. Star power is very clearly in Toronto's favor, and goaltending is in Boston's. Take into account that the star power is going to control the ice for most of the game, and the goaltending better be fucking phenomenal. It's, it's not a rosy outlook. I'm not down on the team. I'm not disappointed. We might... There's a real conversation where, like, were the Bruins even supposed to be here this year? And we are the home team in this round. This has been a great season for Boston. It ain't over either. This is going to be a great series, uh, an entertaining series. And should doesn't mean shit. Leafs fans are scared. Bruins fans are scared. This could be a springboard kind of series for either team. If the Bruins win this... They feel like they can beat anybody. If the Leafs win this, they finally did it. And they could ride that momentum all the way to a cup final. Where they'll get shit stopped by the Stars. Oh, and last thing. Bruins, game one lineup prediction. I think I'm just going to go with what Fluto said. Because it really seems like they're staying consistent with that. Heinen, Zaka, Pasternak. Marshan, Coyle, DeBrusque. Lauko, Geeky, Frederick. Beecher, Boquist, Maroon. JVR takes the seat. He gets scratched. Linton, McAvoy. Grizz Carlo, a pairing I'm a little nervous about. Shattenkirk peak. Lori Watherspoon, both uh, will be scratched, but they'll be hanging out with the team. And then Olmark gets game one with a tentative plan to start swaying game two, depending on how it goes. This is going to be a great series. I'm terrified. I'm genuinely terrified. And please don't think I'm being negative. I'm just pointing out numbers and history of the league and history of matchups. It makes a lot of sense that Toronto has the advantage.
Doesn't bother me none. Should don't mean shit. Go bees. Go bees! And once again, it's time to give shout outs to those who are keeping the lights on for this channel. We got a shout out our top line tier to start. Let's start with Erica Pulley, Colin Nolan, Len Krusevich, The Bugman, Brock Nope, Han Slomo, Coach D, The Atomic Lizard, Bradley Johnson, Aaron Adams, just Aaron, Darren Woodbury, Brett Arney, Pinsent, and Nick Zatrulo. You guys and gals are absolute studs. But we can't mention the studs without mentioning the Stallions, our all-star tier high-quality inspectors, John Kirk, Jacob Pratt, Heil E. Coyote, Adam Ella, Bruin Smash, Tupton Detashi, Joel, Abraxion, De Kingery, The Only Newts, A Tasty Snack, Dutes42, and Jeremy. I can't say thank you enough. I appreciate all the support. Your absolute legends, stallions, whatever great adjective we can work in here. Thank you, everyone, from the depths of my heart. And go bees!